thank you for being patient with me. This is kind of new. I mean, I know, I know, they don't let me out behind the curtain very often. Okay? <laughs> and my wife tells me there's a reason for that. There's a reason. Um, being a, a, a father and a husband and a coach and a manager, Jake, am I okay? Some days, other days, it's debatable. We have a tendency to want to fix things. I am a fixer. They call me when everything else is not when the, I, I say when the fit hits the shan, they call me, okay? And we try to get things fixed up. And sometimes they say to me, you can't fix it. And I'm glad I can't fix it. Two things I learned about understanding faith is there is a God and he has a son named Jesus and I am neither one of them. <laughs> I can't fix it. I can't fix it. Um, I'm sorry, my computer is just not doing what I want it to do. It, did, it does all this other stuff. Hold on just a second. Bear with me. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Um, faith is a learned response. Fear is a learned response. When my grandson was a very small guy and he came out to play with the horses, his mama said, no, 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 no. Don't let him do that. Don't let him do that. And I said to her, you're teaching him to be afraid. Don't teach him. He knows no fear. Fear is always a taught response. Let him play because he'll be all right. Faith is the same way. We have to live in faith. We have to walk in faith. We have to be who we are. Have you ever contemplated why there are not more Christians? Why some of these seats always seem to be empty? That's because it's so hard. It's so hard to believe something you can't see. It's so hard to stand by the rules of God. It's so hard not to put God in my box. He doesn't live in a box, right? He doesn't live in a box. This is the box. Every place is the box, the trees, the grass. This box, your box at home, the land between here and your house, that's his box. So when we say, okay, Lord, we want this, these are, we want this, yeah, you, he wants you to be specific, but he wants you to leave him enough latitude and believe in him enough to do it the way he wants to do it and accept it, whatever the answer is. Oh, perfectly good hallelujah. So, thank you for saying that. A definition of faith is the allegiance to duty or a person. Belief and trust in God. When you find yourself against the wall and you say, look, I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to believe God, I'm going to trust God for this, but as soon as you say but, you take yourself off the faith wagon. You take yourself off the faith wagon. There is no but. It's only God. He's going to do what he wants to do. And guess what? Whether you say but or not, he's going to do that. So just understand it. Hebrews 1, oh, excuse me, complete trust. That was the but part. Complete trust. Complete trust. Hebrews 1 and 11 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's one of the things that makes it really, really hard. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, We live by faith and not by sight. 
Um, one of my sisters walked up to me this morning. She had the notes in there. She said, look at this. I said, well, how did you know all the answers? I wrote it. Let me look and see if you're right. She was right. I, that's because she lives it. She walks it. She does it. And I love her for it. Hebrews 11.13 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, the big box, so that what was seen was not made out of what was visible. Now you want to twist your head around that for a minute. <laughs> It'll take a while. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe. <laughs> Imagine that. He exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's no ifs, no ands, no buts. But I trust you, Lord. I had a friend that probably had one of the most interesting lives of anyone I know. Some good, some not so much. This reflection is during a more difficult time for him. One evening he was going to hang out with his buddies and they were planning to sit around and do what young adults do and when he got to his to the to the house where they were going to hang out his friend and his wife were preparing to leave they were going to church on a Wednesday night wow this was so out of character for them that my friend say ask him if he could tag along mm -hmm. they said sure he said this I gotta see because <laughs> church was really like out of character it was different. They arrived at church late. The service had started. There were two female pastors presiding. Because my friends were late, there had been no introductions. They took seats in the middle of the congregation. My friend was raised Baptist. And anybody who's been in a Baptist church, in my hometown, you go to church Sunday morning, you come home Monday morning. It's kind of like that, okay? <laughs> So when I didn't have to do that anymore, I said, you know what, Mom, I'm good. I'm sorry, Mom, really, I love you. And so there were no introductions. They took seats in the middle of the congregation. My friend was raised Baptist and did not enjoy church at all at that time of his life. It's safe to say he was not a believer. And as I said, this was this was a difficult period for him, so he was very skeptical. Challenges had risen. Rocks were falling out of the sky, hitting this man in the head. And he's going, ah, oh, Lord, really? The congregation was in the worship portion of his services. The song stopped, and the pastor began to enthusiastically pray. In her prayer, she encouraged everyone to get to know God, as she did not think they all did. She suggested that they all bow their heads and sincerely pray to God as a friend. One-on-one -on -one relationship the pastor has always taught us. You've got to have that one-on-one -on -one with the good Lord. Pray to God as a friend. Enlist his help with their needs. My friend got tickled. Laughed. And he thought to himself, yeah, right, <laughs> you bet. <laughs> he had tried quite a few things, he thought, in his life, so he might as well try this. He bowed his head and he prayed. Life had dealt him some very big challenges, as I said earlier. At the time, at that time, he felt alone. So he prayed and asked the Lord that if he truly made all the world and all that is in it, that he, if he truly existed, stop the pastor in mid-prayer, have her point to him, and call him by name. He vowed if the Lord did that, he would believe and follow him forever. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let 
let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. More to follow. <laughs> A definition of forgiveness. To give up resentment. I'll tell you what, this is probably... These two are number one and number two in my book as far as Christianity is concerned, right? So you got one ro rolls with the other. To give up resentment, to pardon, not almost, not sort of so-so, pardon, to grant relief from payment. Forgiving is defined as allowing room for error or weakness. That means that Jesus don't live in a box, especially my box, okay? That person that doesn't think like you, walk like you, look like you, act like you. So what? It's not on you. It's not on me. It's up to the Almighty. No matter what it is, no matter what it is, seek God first and listen to his voice and direction. And if you do that, you'll hear it, you'll see it, and you'll know it. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And he'll do it. Second Chronicles 7.15 Now my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> James T. James T. James T. was having health issues and needed an operation. He called me to help give him guidance and comfort. He let me know that through the medical procedure, though the medical procedure was to be minor, he was concerned that due to his health complications, he might not survive. I reminded him that the doctor said that everything should be fine, he's all right. That did not seem to comfort him as much as I had hoped. He and I were both fans of Western pictures. I still am. Y'all that know me know I'm, I'm a horseman all the way. Runs my wife crazy. Let me tell you something. You want to start, you want to start the steam flying in our house? Turn on a black and white Western movie from the day. Okay? Are you watching that again? You've already seen it a hundred times. I know all the lines in that movie. And she's right. No, she's right. It's just, that's, I like that part. He and I were both fans of Western pictures. I took the opportunity to quote from one of the movies I had seen because he was one of the bravest people that I knew, ever knew. I thought he could relate. I told him that a coward dies a thousand times. The brave only once. And that's the truth. That's the truth. My mother, when she passed, when I was just away from my mother, they told me, they told me my mother refused all medication. I'm not taking nothing. I'm not taking nothing. My son, my youngest son, Bear, he said, man, she went out like a G. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't take any medicine, none. And she laid there and her, her last thoughts of contemplation were, to my little brother and my baby sister, and they're adults now. Yeah. <laughs> Are you all right? Are you all right? She wasn't thinking about her pain. She wasn't thinking about how she was hurting. She wasn't thinking about her fear on what was going to happen next. And yes, she was a Christian. That's another topic of discussion. We'll talk about that another time. But yes. She was a Christian. She knew the Lord very well. She and I talked many times about the Lord and who he is and what he can do and how he can do it. Because everybody has a time where they say, Lord, this is so hard. And they need that voice in their ear that says, 
just like you guys did for me this morning. So, Mike, it's all right. You're family. It's all right. They need that voice in their ears that say, it's all right. So when it gets like that, you only go once. And she went with glory. And my mother was single parent, mother of five. I watched, I watched as a young, young boy, my father take my biological father, bring my youngest sister home from the hospital to my mother. We lived in three rooms, not three bedrooms, three rooms. He brought my baby sister home, sat her, sat her in my mother's lap and left. Five children she had. I'm the oldest of five. Five children she had. That's kind of a bad thing because that left me a little bit of responsibility. <laughs> Runs my wife crazy. <laughs> there are days she likes it and then days she don't, but it is what it is. So anyway, sorry about that. My wife told me, my wife told me, don't be long-winded. <laughs> I told her, I just got to be who I am. <laughs> okay. Just all it is to So anyway, where was I? It's all right to say a good amen and a good hallelujah. I don't mind. See, pastor, you're on vacation. You're on vacation. <laughs> so um, he was one of the bravest people I ever knew. I told him that a coward dies a thousand times brave only once personally. That's a phrase that helps me through from time to time because it does continue to get rocky. It's not going to stop. That's what one of the other things that makes Christianity so hard. If it was easy, there'd be a line out on, out on Juanita Boulevard. Right. It's not easy. So, but it did not help him. It helped him some, but not as much as I'd hoped. Then I asked him, the serious question. I asked, was he ready to go before the judgment seat? He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, have you forgiven all those that have trespassed against you? No matter what. Now listen, you don't have to raise your hand or answer this question out loud, but think about it. Who in your life has done something that was so bad that you really haven't quite let it go. You've tried, and some have tried again, but you really haven't quite let it go. Think about it. And what did he say? He replied, nope. I loved him, but that man carried a grudge like it had handles. It was just that, <laughs> it was just that simple. I offered to pray with him to offer up the forgiveness he had not. He said that he could not, and he declined. That comment made me very uneasy and nervous, as it would. Luke 6.37 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive. Say it again, girl. And you will be forgiven. That's the truth. That's the book. That's the truth. So for that person or people or subjects or whatever in your life, in the morning I pray, and I learned that from Pastor too. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> but in the morning when I pray, one of the first things I say Lord, forgive my sins. After the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, I say that again. Lord, please forgive my sins. This is every single day. Please forgive my sins. Please forgive those who trespass against us. Me, you, Lottie, Dottie, everybody. Okay? Take us all to the foot of your cross and forgive us. Help me to forgive us. Not just them. All of us. Me too. 
a lot of people forget that part too. They, they, one of the people that they, they can't forgive is themselves for something they did and they can't let it go because they can't get it out of, the, out of their hands. Pastor has taught on this many times. We have to learn to forgive ourselves our sins and let, let the good Lord have that. Okay? I like y'all, y'all. Y'all pretty easy. Let me see who knows this answer. To find forgiveness, you must practice forgiveness. forgiving. Everybody gets an A. <laughs> oh, I, I thought I put it up there. You cheated. Bad. Bad. I said forgive enough. But <laughs> okay. Um, Father, please forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I said that already, but I say that every day. And I hope you all say that every day, too. It's important. Pastor has always taught us to start the day in prayer. And when you start the day in prayer, ask to forgive your sins. That way, anything that you have uh, done accidentally or not is not going to come before the seat when you're petitioning for someone else or something else or whatever else you're praying about. Get your sins forgiven first. Clean the slate. Get out the Clorox like my wife does. You walk behind my wife in the house, you better watch your clothes because she's, Clor <laughs> <laughs> she's a Clorox girl, okay? I love you, dear. Dinner's going to be a little tough tonight. Okay? <laughs> she's giving me the, you got to come home look. <laughs> Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive men when they, or women when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 6, 15, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. And this is, I, I call it note to self, okay, but this is, not just to me, this is for everybody. You don't have to answer this, just think about it. Do we forgive like that, no matter who, no matter what, unconditionally? Have we learned to forgive ourselves? We've talked about this. Have we been baptized? Okay, you want to talk about it? Anybody who has not been baptized, step, in, step up in January and go down to the water with Pastor Bill in January and, and get dunked. Huh? You'll only do that once, I promise. Yeah, take your wallet with you. Right? you got to take your wallet with you. That's so it gets baptized too. Um, have we established a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus? All these points are very, 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 very important. Let's see, reflections. I said more to follow, didn't I? What happened to the friend in Stand Up? What happened to James T? Y'all want to know that or can I go on off? <laughs> I love y'all too. Before the prayer was finished in my friend's mind, or in, yeah, in his mind, the pastor looked up from her own prayer. She appeared to be examining the congregation. She put her finger in the air and she continued to examine the faces and finally, finally pointed to my friend and said, you, Michael, stand up. She informed him that the Lord had seen his plight and heard his petition. She said that if he would accept Jesus in his life and follow him, he would never be lost again for the rest of his life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Whew. Have mercy. When I last checked, Michael had since been watched over and blessed by the Lord time and time and time again. His life still had trials. There were still stones falling from time to time. But there was always a way out. 
a voice that had the answer. I know this to be true because I lived it. And I continue to live it today because I'm Michael. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm Michael. Yes. So when you worry, when you think, boy, that guy behind the curtain sure is filled up with it. He sure has the fire. That's why. When I, when I didn't have anything else, anybody else, nothing else, he reached down and made time for me, just me. I've not looked back since. He gave me a wonderful wife, three wonderful children that all know God and love God and follow God. He's given me one grandson and about to give me a granddaughter, which are the greatest gifts. The greatest gifts. I don't know. My wife says she got to travel to West Virginia every morning. So I'm going to have to get another job. But you know what? My wife, Michelle, has been with me over 40 years. And she deserves that. She deserves that. The Lord knows that ain't been easy. What's this one going to say? Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Faith is the hardest when, when it's tough, when things don't look right, when things don't feel right, when things don't look like it's going to happen like you want it to happen. That's when faith is the hardest, and that's when you've got to step back, step aside, and say, good Lord, whatever you decide to do. It's good enough for me. Your grace is sufficient for me. Amen. And when you do that, and you mean that, either way it goes, you're going to win. Because if he doesn't do what you want him to do at that time, he's going to show you why. And you're going to go, oh. Oh. I love it when customers, you know, customers say, I want this, I want that, I want the other. And I go back and I say, but this, 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 and this. And they go, oh. <laughs> So, trust him. Let's see. James T. James T. had his surgery. When it was completed, I was called and told that he had slipped into a coma. The family asked if I could fly out in hopes that that would help him, help bring him around. When I arrived, he was still in a coma. What they did not know was that James T., had asked that I make sure that he was not left on life support of any kind for any reason. That if it came down to it, all life support was to be removed. James T. felt that I was the only one who he could trust to see that this wish was honored. The family and I were in the, in the waiting room when the doctor came and told us that for all intents and purposes, James T. was brain dead. The doctor asked, what did we want to do? And I said, Doc, I am his oldest son. He asked that all life support be removed. Then I asked, are you going to remove it or am I? And he looked at me like, whoa. Yeah. I said, whoa, was right. You know? uh, <laughs> he and I went into the room, and I prayed, and I held his hand as the final beeps on the machine that indicated life faded to a stop. Based on the interactions that we had recently shared, I'm not sure if he made it through the gates of glory. I prayed for him, but I'm not sure because of what the word said. Though he had not been the best father to me, I told you, I watched him, small kid, sit my baby sister in my mama's lap and turn around and walk away. And let me tell you something, that wasn't the only thing. I could stand here for another hour and tell you about things that my father did or did not do that weren't the brand of a good father. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. 
Doesn't matter. He had not been the best father, and it was not up to me to judge. Eventually, when I became an adult and he got older, he slowed down and I sped up and we formulated a relationship. But that relationship was only possible because of one thing. I forgave him. I truly in my heart forgave him. Everybody didn't, but I did. I truly in my heart forgave him. He met his grandsons. He met his daughter-in-law, but he knew her anyway. He saw that God, one of the reasons he called me when all this was jumping off was because he knew that I knew someone that could possibly help. I believe, I truly believe, let me see if I said that here. I pray that he had been forgiven and made it into glory. I hope to see him there one day. I don't know. I'll know when I get there because he'll be standing right there at the gate telling me something to do. <laughs> and then my mama will step up right behind him. And that'll be the end of that. <laughs> Just saying. One thing I want to leave you with. One thing. We talked about that. What do you think? Is that good? That's no good? Heavenly Father, Bless this house. Bless this lesson. Bless these people. Lord, don't let these words fall to the ground. If there's one person here or listening that these words should touch, Lord, I ask, let them be touched. Let them see who you are. Let them feel who you are. Let them know who you are. Lord, I ask you to bless and to keep them. Make your face shine down upon them and grant them peace. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.